Hello, everybody. Christian Shaw here, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Becoming Bankable podcast. With me today, I'm with Bruce Alexander, an authenticity coach, the CEO of Authenticity Identity Management, and also a podcast host of Authentic On Air with Bruce Alexander. Um, He's the self-proclaimed confident coward. He's used authenticity and identity coaching to experience breaking out of a shell, living an authentic life. He spent almost 10 years as a career firefighter, 15 years as a father, and almost 20 years as a husband. And I'm so happy to sit down with you today, Bruce, and, and learn more about your story and learn more about your what you bring to to others in the world of authenticity. So thank you. Thank you, Christian. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'm excited to have this conversation and to, you know, my mission in this world is to try to make the world a safer place to show up as yourself. And, you know, every time mm. I talk about it, I think that I'm doing that. So I'm happy to be here and, you know, to serve my mission. Amazing. So I, I'd love to jump right into it. I have a few questions and just love to learn what is an authenticity coach and why does it matter to be authentic or not? Well, I mean, that's, that's a pretty loaded question. Um, <laughs> the I'll start with what is an authenticity coach. So, you know, there's Life coaches are all, they're abound, you know, they're everywhere. You can lift a rock and find one. Um, I didn't want to, like, I, I did life coaching training. It was too, was much, much too broad for me. And it didn't, it didn't really speak to me as to what I thought I brought to the table. I've had some experiences in my life where they've really shaped me to be who I am today. And a lot of them had to do with being somebody I thought the world wanted me to be. It didn't work. I didn't realize it for a long time that it just came off as disingenuous, as fake, and that I didn't have any deep and meaningful connection in my life because I was trying so hard to be something I wasn't. Through those processes, I learned a lot. And I, I want to use my experience and then my training, my skills to help people fast forward through all the trauma that I had to get through to get here. And I want to help them leapfrog that and start, be, start loving themselves as soon as possible. And that's, you know, I mean, that answers kind of both the question as to what I do and why it's important, because I think that it's really hard to to find true, deep and meaningful uh, connection and success in this life if you're trying so hard to to fulfill other people's desires for what you were supposed to do. You know, I think that realigning what you're doing in this world, with what your actual true values, beliefs and desires are is how you start to live a, a truly meaningful life. And I want to help people do that. I'm very curious about the subject matter. I haven't really heard of this in the past before I started talking to you about this, but it's so, it's so important. We live a certain way on social media. We live a certain way in real life and with our, with our friends and, and family and communities. So I'm, I'm really curious how you got started on this path of becoming authentic yourself and becoming an authenticity coach and how, you know, where that, where that journey has taken you. Sure. So I, I'd love okay. to kind of, like, yeah, I'd love to kind of like backtrack and like take it from the beginning. What, what made you get interested in becoming authentic? Why, what was that like kind of take us back in your life and, and tell us why that was really important for you? So there, there were several different instances in my life where being fake had, you know, had really served me poorly. And it took a it took an accumulation of these events to to actually realize that that was the thing that was that was consistent. It wasn't somebody else doing this or me being you know unlucky in that. It was that over and over again I was showing up as somebody I thought I was supposed to be, and that person was failing to succeed. That person was being taken advantage of. That person wasn't understanding what was wanted in the situation, and so I was getting poor results over and over and over again. Um, most recently was I, I'd spent 10 years as a firefighter and that entire process was extremely difficult. It's a, it's a hard job to get onto, you know, it, it beats you down both mentally and physically. And that, that's just the norm. Like that's for everybody. Well, for me, I'm, I'm ADHD. That is something I didn't understand affected my, my ability to socially interact with people. And so whenever I was dealing with these other firefighters, and they were telling me over and over again, like, you just don't get it. I was like, it what? what? What is it? And so I kept trying to figure out what it was and do the thing that they wanted me to do. 
And I was just, you know, contorting my vision of myself in every which direction to try to make myself what they wanted. And it wasn't possible. I was not who they wanted. And that's, that's okay to be somebody that doesn't fall in line with somebody else's expectations. But I wasn't okay with that. You know, that was something I struggled with really badly. I wanted them to like me. I wanted to get along. I wanted to, you know, fit in. And I tried so hard over and over again to fit in that it just pushed me farther and farther out of the group. And also at the same time, farther and farther away from who I really was. And whenever you get, when you get in that situation, before you know it, you find yourself completely alone. You know, um, I, like I said, I'm married, I'm a parent, but you can be alone and still have companionship. You know, my wife loves me through all of this. She's a, a great woman and is without her assistance, I don't think I would have gotten here, but I was still alone because I didn't know who I was. I had, I had no foundation of who myself was because I'd been trying to be what other people wanted for so long. And right. I didn't, I didn't even know what I wanted people to like about me. I had nothing to bring to the table about myself. I can relate. I, I think everybody can relate to a, a version or a story of this um, because everybody wants to fit in from childhood. It's like what we want. We don't want to be the, the kid sitting alone at the lunch table, eating by himself or herself. We want to be cool and popular. And that extends into adulthood. You know, high school never ends for a lot of people. And um, I, I certainly feel that way that, you know, when I was back in high school, I, I definitely felt like identity crisis and having to fit in. So as a firefighter and working with your, your, um, your company and your firefighter uh, Conrad's, like, how did you, how did you first get the inclination? Like, this is something I need to change. Like, how did you first, how did you stumble upon this is the solution for you and, and how to kind of like walk us through that process of, of learning. So unfortunately I, I never found the solution. Like, so I, I worked in the field for seven years in which, you know, I was actively going in and fighting fires and I was stationed at the same place for uh, almost six of those years. And that crew that I was with was largely made of, you know, the same core of people as, you know, people came in and came out. I never got to a place where I fit in with them. Like it was a mm. con it was a constant struggle of them telling me how much I sucked, you know, being extremely negative, excluding me, isolating me. Like it w it was it was a a traumatic experience every day I went into work. So that that obviously did not come to a, a solution. I eventually I promoted out. You know, it's luckily it's not a popularity thing to to promote in the fire department. It's based on testable skills. And like I tested out and I promoted twice. I got out of the field and became a public educator. And I was really good at that. But unfortunately, the the same thing holds true as what you're part of a crew. And the, the fire department mentality is very strong. It's a culture of, you know, when you get a reputation on the department, you can't really shake it. And that reputation is usually developed by your interaction with one or two people. And they influence very strongly how everybody else feels about you. Some people say that they, you know, they'll let you start from ground zero and make it. But as soon as you make one mistake that looks like what they thought they heard, then they're right back in the same, the same thing, you know, the same thing. And my mistake was that I was, quote unquote, making excuses all the time because I was honestly trying to understand what people wanted from me. And whenever you're like, this is a, it's a common ADHD thing to say, like, I don't understand what the difference between making excuses and giving an explanation because somebody will say something like, why did you do that? And you'll start to tell them, at least that's what I would do. It was like, okay, this is why I did it explaining. And this is stop making excuses. And so I became the person who made excuses. And for me, the way my brain works is like, I'm trying to solve this problem. I need more information. I did this. Tell me why that was wrong. Instead of, in the fire department, you're just supposed to keep doing it until you do it right and not talk about what, like you just, you're supposed to just figure it out. And that was never, it was never going to jive with who I was, but I kept trying to make it, kept trying to make it happen. And the, the really hard part about that whole situation was I was only there at the fire department in the first place because it was what somebody else wanted. Now it did provide me with, uh, with a step up to, to provide for my family. It's a, it's a great career as far as 
taking care of your family goes. But I only did it because my father and my uncle were both firefighters. They both, you know, they both were built for it and I wasn't. And but so I let them eventually over like a long time talk me into it because I needed to provide for my family. I wasn't doing it well. And they're like, you can do it this way. This is how you can do it. And so I took their their desires for me, their vision for me, and I put it on as my own. And I and I sold myself that lie for almost 10 years in which I, I ne- was never, I never felt true fulfillment. I never felt true happiness. I was really just pretending this entire time to be content in my life. And I wasn't. And it was spilling yeah. out all over everybody else who was involved. Yeah, I think every a lot of people can relate to that point of being forced into a lifestyle or occupation that was forced upon them from other people, most notably parents. I know like a son of immigrant parents, a lot of my friends as well, they wanted us to become lawyers, doctors, go into the medical field. And it's really like what the parents want, not what the actual the child, the, the person wants themselves. So that is a huge expectation and pressure to put on someone who's just trying to navigate and learn about who they are um, navigating in this world. Let me let me add something so, to that really quick. Um, yeah, please. You know, please talking go. about parental expectation, my father and I are like, we're currently on the rocks because he's upset at me. I'm almost 40 years old, right? And he's upset that I'm not listening to his advice about where, what I should do next with work. Like, I'm like, I'm trying to start a business dad. Like I'm, you know, I'm all in on myself and he's telling me mm-hmm. that, you know, I'm obviously depressed. I'm making bad decisions for my family. I'm, you know, I'm not doing things that are going to, you know, he has no belief in me whatsoever. And I don't think it's because he doesn't like me or he doesn't love me or he doesn't want the best for me. I think that that generation specifically is so, entrenched in the ideas of what success looks like that if you're not making a specific dollar value or on the track to a specific job title then you can't be successful like period in their eyes and that's something that has been really hard for me to shake off and realize that i don't care about that like what success looks like for me is completely different than what it looks like for him and i've tried to give him the opportunity to meet me where I'm at. You know, it's like, Hey dad, like, I appreciate what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I know it's because you love me, but what I want for my life, my family is this. Can you just try to be around and and enjoy, you know, the family, be happy that you're a grandfather. So far, the answer has been no. And that's that it's, it's hard to take, but also it has given me an enormous amount of relief to just stop trying to be something for him and instead embrace my life and start acting for me and just get like, I want to give him every chance to meet me where I'm at. I really do. I want him to come be a part of it, but if he doesn't want to, it's not my problem. Man, how, how, how do you even start on this road? So let's say we're, you know, the viewers, the people watching or listening, they have parental expectations. They have, you know, to make, make, make ends meet to provide for their family. They have to support, um, you know, their, the people who depend on them. How is it that, you know, it it seems like such a, it seems like such a fantasy in in some people's mind to live out their authentic, true life, because it seems so far-fetched. It seems so unprobable. And it seems like a fantasy that, you know, is, will never come true. How do you bridge that gap? Or, you know, what, what do you say to those people who are like stuck in this rut they want more. They just can't. They just don't know what to do. How, how, what yeah. would you say to those people? I think that's a great question. And I think that, it, you know, it is it is a fantasy, but sometimes your fantasy can become your reality. And that's, you know, that's a matter of how hard are you willing to work and how much are you willing to sacrifice? You know, I'm not going to pretend like me stepping into my authentic life has not cost me. It has. It's cost me immensely. It's cost me the security of a career that, you know, was going to provide for me for the rest of my life and for my family and retirement and all that stuff. It cost me that, that that's gone. You know, I'm, Mm -hmm. I'm completely depending on myself to make sure that me and my family are able to survive and I don't have a security net. So that, you know, that is the cost I'm willing to pay to live that fantasy of living for myself. So that's the first thing. 
But if I were like, if I were talking to somebody else, who's not me, who's, who's not ready to take that full step yet, it's okay to start preparing for your dream whilst keeping a foot rooted in reality. The first step is you have to stop living for everybody else's dreams. That doesn't mean that you have to stop doing the thing that you're doing immediately. You just have to stop doing it for someone else. So if you're working in a career that you don't love, but it's, it's giving you the money, stop doing it for the reason that you're doing it that you hate it for and start doing it because you're providing enough money to put aside to start doing the thing that you love. That you're, that you're giving yourself the, the time to go get educated so you can start on the career path that you wanted. You know, whatever it is, is just take that step to stop doing it for whomever you're doing it for and start doing it for yourself. It doesn't mean that you have to stop doing that thing. You just have to do it in a way that serves your, your beliefs, your values, and your goals. I love that. It reminds me of uh, Jim Rohn, if you're familiar. He always Where? says this. His, this has stuck with me for um, over a decade. Yeah, since a decade now. He says that um, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And that hit me like a ton of bricks when I, when I first saw that or heard that. Um, I was so focused on the co- like getting a good degree, getting a good job, working up a corporate ladder, and pushing all that energy into the actual job that I was working on and just leaving myself completely behind and just doing it for the paycheck. I think it's a real, and you're saying you don't have to change anything about what you're doing, but kind of like just changing the lens or the frame that you, that you're thinking about what you're doing and start the process through, through that. Is is that, would you agree? Yeah, I'd say that it's the first step. Changing your perception is the first step because if you're, if you are stuck in that mentality that you have to do this thing because you're trying to reach um, making $120,000 a year and having the, this car and having, you know, the, the house, the white picket fence, you've got all these things that you actually in your heart don't care that much about, but you've been told that that's the dream and that you're working towards that. It's hard to, to consider working towards something else at the same time. You know, it's, you know, it takes a certain amount of compartmentalization that, you know, I don't really think is healthy to be serving two masters. Like Mm. you have to, you have to, you can work for one, but you should be serving your, like yourself should be the ultimate priority. I want to make sure to frame this properly because a lot of people think that this is like a, a selfish way to live. But for me, when I think, when I think of being authentic, the responsibilities that I've taken on such as being a father and being a husband are part of living for myself. Like I want to be a better husband. So whenever I take time for working on myself, being a better husband is part of that. I want to be a better father. So whenever I talk about, you know, being like self care or, you know, working on myself, being a better parent is part of that. Those responsibilities I've taken on are part of my authentic. Yeah. Cause you can't show up for your wife or your children if, or, you know, the other people who depend on you, if you don't have, anything to give to them. Like you have to fill up your own cup before you can give to others. I really like that. And that's, that's one of the bigger things that whenever it comes to talking about taking on a coach or going to therapy or whatever, is that people are terrified to put themselves first in that way because they don't want to have the, the, the fight with their spouse about them putting that time towards themselves. When in all actuality, most spouses if, if presented in the right way, we'll say, oh, yeah, of course I want you to I want you to love yourself. Of course I want you to take care of yourself. Of course I want the best version of you I can get. Like, who's going to say, no, I don't want you to grow? That's gross. Like, if, if that's what your spouse is saying, then maybe it might be time to consider some, like, some couples therapy because that's, that you know, I definitely don't want to say, like, in any of these situations that just raising and burning down everything in your life is the, is the go-to move. Like, I don't think that's the situation. If you're trying to work on yourself and you're getting pushback from your spouse or your family, to me, that says, okay, you need to look at why they're struggling with you putting healthy boundaries in place. It doesn't mean like just boot everybody that doesn't like your new boundaries. Like I encourage people to, to work on that and, you know, have those conversations and try to get at the root of what's going on there. And then if you're, if you're unable to, 
to come to some sort of consensus where you can, you know, have that growth and still have them in your life. Maybe it's time to take a, you know, a little break from them. So you're able to do that work and then have a strong enough constitution to be able to have whatever toxicity that they're bringing into your life without it making you want to just bail on them completely. Yeah. Me, me personally, to just to share from my personal experience, I have definitely been in relationships that have not served me. Um, and then were actually holding me back from the person I was trying to become. And when you were saying, you know, like who would, who wouldn't support loving yourself, becoming your best self. Unfortunately, in, at least in my experience, there have been people like that and it sucks because you care for them and and at the same time you want to like you got you can't just stay you can't just stay in there um yeah i don't know if you have any thoughts on this what what would you say to people who are in those types of relationships either parental i know you're dealing with right now or you know spousal relationships how do they start that conversation with with them it's a, it's a tough conversation and what I what I think is really important is like information, um, being able to, the more informed you are of a problem, the better you're able to communicate it to other people's. So if you are saying like, if you're just stuck and you're just saying like, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. Like nobody is going to hear that and, and think that you have any idea what you're doing. They're going to, they're going to say, well, you're stuck. Here's what you need to do. This is how you get unstuck. Let me tell you whenever you say, okay. So I've been I've been doing some research and like I found that I, I'm ha I'm dealing with this problem and I think that it's because I've been doing this thing and I think the solution is this. Could mm. would you be would you be on board with supporting you know X Y and Z to help me move towards this solution? Making them part of the solution versus part of the problem is always a good way to help somebody feel involved in that process so they don't feel mm. like they're an enemy of it. I mean, that's the mm. last thing you want is, is your spouse or your parent as an enemy of that process. But sometimes they are going to be an enemy of that process because sometimes they just are. Sometimes people do not want do not want your growth. But those, unfortunately, are the people that you don't need in your life while you're trying to grow. It doesn't mean that you, they might not be able to come back in at a later date. But whenever you're in that active growth stage, you can't you can't spend all your time fighting people off who are trying to pull you back down. Like, I mean, right. that, it's exhausting. It is absolutely exhausting. And then you don't have time to do the work you need to do on yourself. Yeah. The way I look at it is like, if I'm broken, like I'm dealing with my own problems, I'm trying to get to this next stage of my life. I can't, I can barely do this much for myself, grow myself and work on and improve myself. If there's a whole nother person who's actively, you know, suppressing that, and, and, and hurting that from, from, from me, you know, achieving that. So <clears throat> it's, um, it's really big. It's really big to be mindful. It's also a very hard, tough, like these are tough conversations. Yes. This Absolutely. is a tough conversation to have with anybody as well as even ourselves, you know, yeah. like a lot of times I, I don't even want to think about the stuff that I'm doing wrong. Like it's, it's hard to be cognizant and, self-reflective on those on those issues let me let me jump in real uh, quick christian yeah please self-awareness self -awareness is my like number one like highest trait that i that i push is that you have to be willing to to look at yourself introspectively and be honest like that to me is where i got lost so hard is that i stopped looking inside and so whenever i started pushing these lies on myself it was so easy to believe them because I stopped turning inward to look at what was going on inside. So I was like, okay, I believe this lie that I'm pushing. Sure. I'm happy. Sure. I love this job because I didn't want to look inside because I was terrified of what I would see. Um, mm. I think that that's where I, that's where somebody like me comes in handy is because having somebody hold your hand through that process, because it is scary. It, mm. I mean, it absolutely is scary. It is hard. Like I, I didn't do it by myself. I had my wife was, I did the bulk of the work. I, you know, did a lot of research, found a lot of understanding of what I needed to do, but I still needed somebody to help like hold my hand through the worst parts and, you know, and rub my back while I was crying as I was dealing with the trauma that I'd been through that I hadn't processed. You know, as I was dealing with that, I needed somebody and it's okay right. to need somebody. 
you know, it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be, you know, your best friend. It could be a therapist. It could be your counselor, but you're going to likely need somebody to, if you're actively avoiding what's inside, you're going to need somebody because there's something in there that you really, really don't want to look at. You know, as I'm talking to you, Bruce, as I'm learning more about this authenticity coaching, this whole, you know, this whole coaching topic that we're talking about, I find it like really, really cool. Like I have a, I have a personal trainer. I never wanted, I I'm a type of person who doesn't like to ask for help. I like to do everything myself. And because of that, I've had to, you know, wait a lot longer to see the results because I'm just trying and failing and and trying to do everything myself rather than find someone, a professional or, you know, an expert who who can actually start to guide me in these areas of life. So I'm doing this for my personal health, my nutrition, uh, my business, but I've never really considered from a personal standpoint, a coach for, for my authenticity. Yeah. So it's a really interesting, um, this whole world. How did you stumble upon this and what? So, yeah. So like the, the thing that happened first was my experience, like was me just finding this struggle that is just like, I kept hitting my head on it and was whenever I finally figured out for myself, that was the thing. It was like, it was not showing up in real life, like not showing up real in life. That was the thing that I could trace back to over and over all these failures, like up to the time I was like 14, 15 years old, like all these things, you know, that I I had written off to being other people's fault, but like have massively shaped who who I am. I, I'd not shown up as myself and I could look back and see if I had shown up as myself, how different it would have been. And then, you know, even going back to the fire department, if I had had somebody like myself from the outside to help walk me through how to deal with these people who didn't, who didn't want to accept what I was bringing to the table. My, my whole situation there would have been different. My whole experience would have been, I'm not going to say it would have been perfect. I don't think it would have been because I still think that there are mismatches. There are going to be times where you just don't fit, but the way that you operate in situations that you don't fit, you don't change. You don't sacrifice yourself because the the self sacrifice on top of other people beating you down makes it almost unbearable. You know that that was what it was for me. So if I had been able to go back and tell myself, "Hey, stop trying to be what you think they want. They don't like you. It, it's it's okay. You have to work together as long as they respect you, respect what you're doing work wise. They don't need to like you." And if I had been able to tell myself that and I had just started showing up to work to work and stop trying to wear every one of their opinions like it, like it was my skin, then I would have been so much happier just in life because that I left that job every day and wore it until I came back the next shift. Like mm-hmm. it, it, just, it just weighed so heavily on me. My, I was terrified for my uh, text messages to ring because I was afraid they were going to say something. I didn't want my phone to ring. Like I didn't want to. De- I didn't want to engage in life because it was crushing me so bad. And that wasn't because they had so much power. It's because I had given them so much power. And so coming to that conclusion for myself was like mm. it was mind blowing. Like it, it really did. It changed the entire way that I viewed life. And I was and I immediately started thinking like this is in some part what I'm meant to do. I'd, I'd gone back to college recently to get my bachelor's and I'd been doing graphic design stuff. And I thought that I wanted to do this in a way to which I helped people produce content that more represented themselves. And to a degree, like that's still something I want to do. Like I want to look into in the future, but the more I, I started to build up my business plan and try to look at what worked and what, what was needed right now, like what I think is needed more right now is my experience and my story to help people who are stuck like I was get to the next, like get to the other side and be able to live a more authentic life and make decisions that are going to help them really supercharge their, their futures. Are there resources or tools or books that you came across in your journey? I know this doesn't happen overnight, but yeah. anything that you can like tangibly look at and say, this is something that, you know, gave me that insight that set me on the right course. I mean, is there, is there 
like I don't want to sound like I'm like full of myself, but this this to me, like there's a lot of stuff that touches on it. You know, you talked about Jim Rohn, Brene Brown. There are a lot of people who touch on these on these things. But for me, it was really it was my experiences and my insights that was able to turn it over for me. And mm. I like I don't think that I'm this, you know, once in a lifetime mind or something. I just think that the resources about being authentic and how you um, how you interact with others in life. I just don't, I don't think that they're widely available yet. And like, as far as I know, I am the only authenticity coach that I've seen. There are lots of life coaches. There's a, there's visibility coaches. There's a lot of people who talk about, you know, really just trying to live your best life. But to me, like it, like it's different. Like, I think that living your life authentically is not about living your best life or, you know, or about putting your best life out to show. It's about being honest about where you're at saying like, sure, like, um, I drink too much or I, you know, I I have extreme anxiety and I don't go out and socialize, but there's a place I want to get to, not because other people tell me that's where I should be, but because I want to get there and I want to set goals and I want to help. I want somebody to help me wade through all the BS I've been living my life as and try to actively move towards those goals in an authentic way. You put it really well. Um, I can't articulate as, as as well you as you just did, Bruce. But you said it's not about living your best life; it's about being authentic and real with where you are right now. Yeah, that's yeah. How how do you mean? Can you unpack that a little bit? Like, sure, I, I'd love to. Like, this is like I think this is the real meat and the real meat of what like I I do is that you know there there's two kinds of people who say like this is who I am. Like there are people who say this is who I am, but it's a lie. It's a show. They're like, you know, oh, this is who I am. I'm just, you know, I'm just mean like this. Usually what that means is like, I'm overly honest because I'm afraid of how people are going to react if I'm actually vulnerable. So I just, I just, you know, I'm just overly brash. Um, There's people like me who say like, this is where I'm at. Not, not this is who I am. This is like, there's no change in me. No, this is like, this is where I'm at right now. Like what's important to me is this, this, and this. It's okay. Like, Hey, I meet a new person and I, we start to have a conversation and it starts to seem like we're actually building some sort of connection. I like to give them as much information as possible. That's going to help us find common ground moving forward. Like, so yeah, Hey, I'm ADHD. You know, sometimes like if, if we like have plans, plans to hang out, you might just want to call and remind me because I don't want to seem like a flake, you know, just give people information. So they're not, making assumptions about who you are. And right. I think that that's like a really important part of like showing up in life is just like giving people information and allowing them to then make decisions themselves versus trying to, you know, uh, force some view that you think that they want on them. You know, I think that a lot of people deserve a lot more credit than they get. And if you tell them like, Hey, I've been going through a really hard time, but like, I think that you're somebody that, you know, even in business, I think it's important in business as well. I was like, I think that we could really work together and make something great, but I've got this, this, and this going on. Like me and my wife have been arguing a lot and I haven't been sleeping very well, but I'm like, we're, we're mending things right now. And I, you're going to see the sharpest version of myself next week. I promise. So otherwise people are going to be, they're going to be making their own assumptions. They're going to be making their own decisions, forming their own opinions in their head without any of the information that you gave them. And then, yeah, and which, once again, giving them the information is not always going to be beneficial to your result, but it's going to be beneficial to your soul. You're going to mm. showing up and giving them the information and saying, like, I know that I told them what to expect. So now they're not going to expect something different. And if they do, that's not on me. Like, I, like I've given them a, a foundation of what to expect. And now I just have to act and do the best that I can. That that's um that's really great. That's really great stuff, Bruce. Um, so much that I want to pick on. Um, I think the main part that I just took away from that is that everybody has their own problems that they're dealing with, and most people are playing their cards close to their chest, and nobody's communicating. And I think if you can be that person who chooses to communicate and be authentic and share your problems with the other person. That's a real, 
that's a real skill set. I, I agree. It is a real skill set, but it's also, it's twofold. It's not just sharing your problems. It's also acknowledging your skills and mm. you know, like knowing your strengths. So it's w- another part of that is like, whenever it comes to like, I'm trying to keep this business wise. It's like, I know that my being ADHD makes me really great at managing projects because it's like, once I get focused on something I'm excited about, I, I mm. go like, and I go hard and you have to pull me out of like, pull me from in front of my computer because I just want to keep going until it's finished. So working with somebody is like, Hey, like I, like I'm a, I'm a shark when it comes to getting things done. That's something that it's good to acknowledge on your, like on yourself. A lot of times people, they don't want to be genuine about the things that are good about them either, because we're as much as our, our society is so individualistic. We've also kind of given people a bad name for like bragging on themselves. And I, I think that if you can be humble, but also self-aware and say, this is something that I bring to the table and I think it could benefit you. There's nothing wrong with that. And often, Honestly, it's a great thing because once again, you're giving them more information to make their decisions based on. So artic- clearly articulating both the strengths and the weaknesses of yourself and being aware of those strengths and weaknesses and being able to communicate it in a way that is um, of hu- humility and just clear. Mm-hmm. That's a real, that, that's the real skill set that, that authenticity enables yeah. And then the, and the last part of that is, so, I mean, you're, you're self-aware, you're able to communicate those things. And then, you know, you're able to let go of other people's, like how they receive that. Like that's, that's an important part of it. And then lastly, you have to understand that n- not all of you is for everybody, you know, just because I am just unabashedly honest about everything that people ask me about, because that is the, the position I've laid out for myself as a authenticity and identity coach and as a, you know, a host of a podcast that's about those things. I think it's extremely important for me to, to be just an open book to anybody who asks about anything, because I want to be visibly and unabashedly authentic. Like that's what I want for me. For other people, it's going to, there are going to be parts of you that aren't for everybody. There are going to be parts of you that are for just your spouse, just because you are, you know, in your opinion, flawed in some way, doesn't mean that everybody needs to know that, but it does mean that you're aware of it and you're aware whenever it's going to affect the situation. And then you give that information. What, how, um, how do you balance that? Like, I know it's like, it's a super general, generalized question, but, um, okay. So for me, I guess to just put on the court, like I'm dating now, I'm actively seeking a, a life partner. This is something that's really important for me. This is one of my big goals. And I'm also a huge traveler. Um, so I'm in Salt Lake City, Utah right now. I'll be in Las Vegas next week. I'm going to be in San Francisco and then back home to New Jersey for a holidays. I've been dating and I've actually just had this conversation with one of the girls that I've I've been dating and seeing, um, I want to be authentic and I want to be honest and open communication, but not every woman likes that I'm traveling around so much and it's not, it's not a very good look. You know, it, it comes off very, uh, for some women, it's not, it's not what they're looking for. So I mean, you, you just answered guess, your question right there, brother. If it's, if it's not what they're looking for and it's you, then they're not looking for mm-hmm. you. Like, I mean, and mm. that's, that's, that is one of those clean cut logical decisions that whenever it comes to like actually applying that it hurts because there's going to be a yeah. girl that you're like, Oh man, I really like her. She's beautiful. Like she makes me laugh, like all these things. But whenever those fundamental things that about you don't line up and you start right. to sacrifice little by little who you are is when you find yourself 15 years down the road, getting a divorce because you tried to make yourself into something that you weren't for this other person. Now mm. I like as much as I can't go back and start dating again. Like I'm really glad that the person who I'm with saw me at my very worst and loved me anyways. Because if I, if I was where I'm at now trying to like go back and, you know, re-navigate like the relationship that we've built based up upon me being somebody like, 
pretend and totally different, then I'd be screwed. Like, you know, it's, it's already enough of a challenge just to work in concert to raid, to build a family together. Whenever you're being yeah. completely honest about who you are and what you want, as soon as you start adding one lie, then two, or, I mean, you don't want to call them lies. Like one, you know, one thing that you've, you've kind of buried a little bit, or you've, you know, given up. It's like, sure. this, it's not that important. Like the, the most important part of that is having your values and beliefs like you have, you have to have them pinpointed to where, you know, like without a doubt, what's important to you. So whenever that, you know, that, that pretty shiny person comes along, you don't start to forget because if you start to forget because that person is pretty and shiny and then, you know, they stop being pretty and shiny because that's what time does. It wears the shine off of things. They stop being shiny. And then you remember about those things that were actually important to you. Then you're going to start to feel bitter towards that person you're going to want to try to start picking those things back up and they're going to say, you know, you said that that wasn't important to you. So what are you a liar? Or do you, you know, if you're not a liar, then you have to forget about that thing because you told me it wasn't important. Like you, you mm. already built in a uh, dissension into the, into the relationship by giving up that thing that's important to you. Is, is this an area of your authenticity coaching that you specialize in or, or like to, to work in and relationships because you could, you could focus on a lot of different various aspects of life through this authentic authenticity coaching. Do yeah. So like pro- my, yeah, my, my four topics are content, family, life and work. So really that could fit pretty much anything. So relationship to me is generally family because I'm more thinking marriage, but it is also just overall life dating to me is life and actual relationship is family. So um, I, I, I enjoy that aspect of it because uh, to me, there's such immediate results. Like whenever you start putting yourself out there as like who you really are in the dating world, you're going to, you're going to see a lot of very like, immediate no's. You're going to be like, hmm. people are going to, you know, you're going to feel some pushback because people aren't going to be used to it. There, you're going to yeah. see a lot of people who are like, what the hell? Like he told me like straight up in the first three dates that he wants to get married and he wants kids and blah, blah, blah. He's looking for a life partner. Uh, no, that's not what I want, but you're going to, mm. uh, the person who you find who actually like cl- like clicks with you is going to say, Oh, Oh, I could, this is, we all like, I'm on line with all this same stuff. And you're not going to, you're not going to be like two shits passing in the night. You're not going to miss them because you, you laid it out up front and they're going to be somebody who is going to receive that and say, I like that about you. I like who you are. I don't want you to change and be something different. Like as you are, I like that. Clear intentions get the point across. Like most people will not have the same values or the same aspirations, but you get to the person that you find that you click with much faster and easier. Absolutely. Well, this is great, Bruce. I I would love to um, conclude or, you know, get to the conclusion of this podcast and like where, what can people where can people find you? What are you looking for for your authenticity coaching? And who who's your dream? You know, people to work with. I'd say. Well, um, first off, like you can you can listen to me talk about these issues about showing up authentic more on my podcast, where I have people come on and I interview them about their stories and their uh, experiences becoming more authentic or not. You know, everybody has their own story, and some people have not been to that place where they're able to show up as themselves yet. And that's, that's okay because that is being able to say that is authentic in itself. And that's called the authentic on air with Bruce Alexander. And that's available on all podcasting apps. And you can also see it on YouTube at authentic Bruce. Um, I'm also on Instagram at authentic identity management, Facebook, the same LinkedIn, also the same. Um, And you can also, if you want to get to know me personally, you can come on my Instagram, Facebook, Bruce Alexander, Beef Wayne on Instagram. Um, as far as my my dream client, my my dream client is ages probably thirty three to forty. Um, I, I recently switched my demographic from female to male because like I'm, I've had like I've recently had an experience with uh, one of my like conversations where I like, I really spoke some power into somebody, and it was it was a male, and like I'd been a, a little afraid to do that, like I. My experiences with the fire department kind of made me a little afraid that men would have 
the reaction to the conversations that I that I wanted them to have, but I've decided to stop being afraid of that and just, you know, and serve who I think will need me the most. And I think that it's men who struggle the most with really showing themselves to the world. That vulnerability part, I think, is especially hard for men. Um, I, I think that also people with ADHD, I think that the, the masking thing is a, an extremely tough part of showing up as yourself because you're, you're just trying to keep up and just trying to, to make it with the, you know, the neurotypicals in the world. And it can be very difficult, but I, I would love to help those people. And I'm overall just looking for anybody who's ready to take that step into authenticity. Like I, I would really love to help them. Um, you can just reach out to me on email at Bruce at authentic identity management.com. I've also got a website called authentic identity management.com. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not completely there. I've recently kind of started remodeling it and it's, I'm, I'm undergoing some training for, uh, for building my content better. And I think that that's going to be, uh, which I wanted to talk about that today, but we obviously got into authenticity way more than I planned on. And that's awesome. Um, but I, if you come to my website and you, and you don't like what you see, I understand it's not, it's not there yet, but, um, if you're interested in, in this, type of conversation, please reach out to me. I would love to see if we're a good fit and if I could help you out. Bruce, I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I would love to have more conversations with you in the future as we continue along this journey. And yeah. I acknowledge you for being super authentic today. So thank, thank you, you for so coming much, on. Christian. Absolutely. I enjoyed it too. Take care, buddy. Take care.